Hello, everybody. I'm Skip Elsheimer. Welcome to the AV Geeks Lunchtime Streaming Show, where we watch old 16 millimeter films. And that was uh, more of the Utz family. Now, I, this came from my friend who's based in Pittsburgh. I don't know if these Utz are related to the new Hanover or the Hanover uh, Utz folks. And I was I've been digging into the Utz uh, potato chip history. And there's not really a Pittsburgh connection, so I, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, but they definitely like to travel, so we have a lot of vacation movies from them. And that was part two of what we showed yesterday, which was a compilation reel from 1954 to 1957. And, um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. I You know... Uh, I have transferred a lot of home movies from that time period where basically people take a month off and they travel. They go up and down the eastern seaboard, they go out west, they go to Alaska, you know, it, it, so it's just, I see a lot of the same footage, but that's the first time I've ever saw the tropical hobby land <laughs> um, where the guy was wrestling the, well, wrestling the alligator. Uh, anyways, uh, let's learn about some glaze application. Enjoy. Glaze is a thin clay pieces at high temperatures. It enhances the piece by color and texture and provides a surface that is easily cleaned. Glaze is usually applied to a bisque piece, one that has been permanently hardened by firing. It can be applied by one of four methods. Dipping, pouring, brushing, or spraying. Before glazing, the surface of the piece must be prepared by thorough dampening to remove dust and prevent too thick a glaze coating. The liquid glaze is composed of powdered ingredients mixed with enough water to make a workable glaze slip. Its proper consistency depends on the method of application and the porosity of the piece. Thing completely covers every detail. Thin spots left by the fingers must be carefully touched up. The pouring method may be used for pieces too large to dip. Such pieces are usually dampened by sponging. The sponge should not be wet enough to drip because a saturated bisque surface will not hold enough glaze. On the other hand, a dry surface would absorb the glaze too rapidly, making the coating thick and uneven. Particular attention is given to the angles formed by the foot rim, the handle, or the lip. Pouring is the only practical way of applying glaze to the inside of a deep piece. Quick rotation completely coats the inner surface. The remaining glaze is to be used in coating the outside. Usually a single poured coat is sufficient. Only the surfaces easily reached are coated by pouring. The handle and other bare spots are touched up later. In touching up, the glaze is flowed on from a fully loaded brush. The brushing method requires a minimum of equipment and glaze. However, special care in application is necessary. A fairly dry brush is used to pre-coat any decorative details, such as these incised lines. A thin coat of glaze stippled into the design prevents air pockets under the next coat. 
Air pockets will cause pinholes in the fired glaze. A fully loaded brush is used when coating the entire surface. Brush strokes should overlap in several directions to avoid bare spots that would cause blemishes. The incised potter's mark should be stippled like the design to prevent air pockets. Quick but careful application prevents drying between strokes and results in an even coating. Two full coats applied in quick succession are sufficient for the underside. A stilt protects the damp glaze coating during the final touching up. Greater richness will result from an additional coat on the upper side. Many effects can be obtained with colored glazes applied by brush. The appearance of any raw glaze seldom suggests its rich final color. This final color depends on the ingredients in the glaze and is developed in the firing. Glaze slip should always be well stirred to assure even consistency. When applied by spraying, it is also strained to remove any particles which might clog the spray gun. The top of the gun must be screwed onto the cup tightly to prevent loss of air pressure. In spraying, as in all other methods, dampening immediately before the glaze application is an important step. The present colors of this piece with its decorative design will be retained by using a glaze which is transparent after firing. The whirler should be clean to avoid spotting the piece. An exhaust fan is necessary to carry away the injurious glaze dust. The spray gun should be tested to be sure it's working properly before application is begun. After the area within the foot rim is glazed, the coating is applied in a continuous spiral down to the outer rim. The gun is held close to the piece and the spray is directed at right angles to the surface. When the glaze no longer glistens, the piece is dry enough to be turned over, but still damp enough to require a stilt to prevent damage to the coating. Merely covering the surface with a spray of glaze is not enough. The first coat must be built up to the proper thickness, indicated by a glistening appearance. To avoid an excess of glaze in the center of the piece, a brush-like motion is used. When the first coat is completely dry, the second coat is applied with the gun held at a much greater distance. Depending on the effect desired, three to six coats may be applied if they are spaced with proper intervals of drying. A porous, granular appearance indicates correct application. A glaze coating is usually thinner on the underside of a piece. Removing glaze from the foot rim before firing will prevent stilt scars on the finished piece. A stiff brush may be used in cleaning the foot rim. However, the last traces of glaze can be removed only by sponging. A fettling knife can also be used to scrape away most of the dry glaze the glaze coating on the inside and outside edges of the foot rim 
should be carefully beveled. Sponging away the remaining glaze provides a professional finish. When there is no foot rim, cleaning is optional. If the bottom is left glazed, small scars caused by the stilt during firing are unavoidable. Unfired glazed pieces must be handled with great care to avoid damage to the fragile glazed coating. Each piece should be examined closely for glazed defects, which must be corrected before firing. Blemishes become permanent after firing. For example, too much glaze or failure to clean the foot rim will cause plate pins or stilts to stick to the piece. These thin spots left by brushing could have been covered by a second coat. Too thin an application may cause unpleasant roughness. An excess of glaze will run down, leaving a pool in the center of the piece. And dust on the surface or too thick a coating will cause this defect known as crawling. Thorough preparation, skillful application, and precise finishing are essential in each of the four methods of glazing. Beautiful and satisfying pieces can be made if care is given to every detail of fine craftsmanship. Oops, sorry about that, everybody. Film kind of ended quicker than I thought. Um... Anyways, that's part of a series that we did, Craftsmanship and Clay, or Clay and Craftsmanship. Uh, behind me, I have a film scanner set up, and we are trying to load it and see if it works. Go, go, go. Yes, we got it. Uh, this is about check fraud. Enjoy. I need some identification, please. Yes, yeah, all right. There you are. I knew you were a doctor, the stethoscope and all. Yes, uh, over in Lakewood. Look, uh, I'm doing surgery in 10 minutes. Uh, doctor, I'm supposed to see your driver's license. I I've got procedures. Well, listen, so have we, and if I'm not performing them in a few minutes... Well, it'll just take a second. I, I really should verify the check. Well, listen, you go ahead. If there are any problems, you call me. Hmm? A doctor... Yes, what is it now? Well, whenever I raise my arm just like this, I, I get a pain right across here and... Well, let me give you some professional advice. Don't raise your arm. Oh, boy. Sometimes this racket is more trouble than it's worth. I don't mean being a doctor. Hell, I'm no doctor. My name isn't even Mark Trumpani, although that's the name I'm using this week. No, sir. Uh, actually, I'm a con man. Although I prefer paper hanger or passer. Has a little more class, you know what I mean? Now, some crooks use guns. Me? I stick them up with paper. Bogus checks and false ID to back it up. Actually, I make a pretty good living convincing all those marks, uh, clerks, that all this paper is good. Being a doctor is just one way. Security guard? A well, policeman works pretty good, too. Hmm? <laughs> but when you're a professional like I am, you don't need all these uniforms. No, sir. Stick around. You might learn something. <laughs> Well, it's that time. Why am I so nervous? 
They sure gave me enough training. I guess the first day on any job's a little scary. Ma'am, could you please tell me where the coffee is? Yes, right over there in aisle 18. Fine, thank you. You're welcome. I want to do everything perfect today. Really impressed, Mr. Norton. Well, here goes. Hi, how are you? Fine. Fine, thank you. Okay, lesson number one. Ooh, excuse me. The secret to any check scheme is quality identification. Sam here prints some of the ID I use. You know, uh, business cards, ID badges, stuff like that. Sam, for crying out loud, it's almost 3 o'clock in the morning. Like I keep telling you, Tony, you can have it done fast or you can have it done right. Now, take your pick. Okay, Sam. In this room, you're the boss. Now, some of the ID I use come straight from the government, like these. Now, look at this. Looks like a legitimate license, huh? At least it started out that way when I bought it from a fence. But if you don't look very carefully, you might accept this. But I'm five feet ten. Look at this. Hmm? It's glued on. Of course, uh, when I do one of my expert routines, who's going to notice? Now, a very slick check passer could get by with some pretty poor pieces of paper. But why take chances? Hmm? Oh, very nice. Very nice. Sam, you're an artiste. <laughs> now I ask you, could anybody turn down an honest face like this? Hmm? For first day, yesterday wasn't so bad, I guess. I think I'll like this job. This guy really needs a new wallet. Would you mind taking the license out, please? Please, buddy. Mm. Mr. Norton was right. Comparing the signatures upside down really does force you to look at them closely. And I need one more piece of identification, please. Let's see. We can't accept social security cards, business cards, library cards. I hope he's got something else. Yes, fine. Thank you. Yes, sir. May Young I... man, I don't have to wait while you flirt with your girlfriend. It was my mother. Yes, well, anyway, I want you to cash my payroll check, please. Uh, is it necessary to have this here? Please remove this from the counter. I, I need to see some ID. Oh, you would, would you? I'd like you to know that I've been in this store before. As a matter of fact, I cashed a check yesterday with your boss. Hello, Mr. Campani. Oh, hello there. <laughs> How's the record business? Oh, so-so. He wants to cash a check. Go ahead, I know. Nice weather, hmm? Beautiful. Mm. Oh, that was an easy 300 bucks. Actually, I did lay a small personal check there yesterday, after I butted up the boss a little. In a few days, that check and the payroll check I just endorsed will bounce higher than a kite. Uh, incidentally, uh, would you like to know where I got that payroll check? From my own company. Oh, yes, I really am an executive. Welcome to corporate headquarters. Really? Using one of my many names, I set up a company. And guess who printed my payroll checks, hmm? The bank. I just make them out to one of my aliases, and I cash them, quickly. I also uh, work with stolen checks for more legitimate businesses. Those are nice pieces of paper to get a hold of. If the company's a big one, nobody's gonna think twice about accepting them. If the checks are taken clean and quiet, it could be weeks before the company finds out someone else is signing its checks. And I've got some inside connections, too. They get me company checks, already filled out and signed. I just stand in for the people who are supposed to get them. Here, it's for $25 more. Do you have one of our cards? No, but here's a driver's license and a credit card. 
Well, um, ma'am, I can take a check for the amount of the purchase, but if you want us to give you cash, you'll have to fill out one of these applications. We'll send you a card in about a week, and then you can cash checks. It's from a local bank. Well, ma'am, it's store policy. All right, I'll write another check, just for the groceries. I wish that didn't have to be part of the job. She's probably telling the truth, but I've got to follow policy. Well, I've got a little time. Why don't you go ahead and give it a full tune-up? Uh, by the way, uh, will you take a check? Sure. Good. A lot of stores ask you to fill out application forms to cash checks. Now, if they really looked at those application forms, it might do them some good. But they don't. And that just helps me. Like this store over here. Last week, I went in and filled out one of their precious application forms. Most of the time, they don't even look at the things. But for some reason, the guy over there checked out mine. Now, did he look up my company in the phone book to see if it's legit? No, that takes time. He just called the phone number I gave him, and my friend was ready. Good afternoon, Analog Development Associates. May I help you? Mr. Trumpany, yes, he's been with us quite some time. Sure. Mm -hmm. Have a nice day now. So, now I've got one of their cards. And they'll never ask for any other ID, so I've got it made. And I didn't have to forge any signature because I signed the card myself. Uh, actually, I'm not very good at faking signatures. And that's why I don't work traveler's checks. But I've got a friend, Jason. This guy is poetry in motion when it comes to the loops and the dots. But even he takes some precautions. For instance, he traces over the top signature with his big felt tip pen in his handwriting. Now, do clerks ever hold the check up to the light and see the first signature? No way. I'd like to cash this check, young lady. And here's my courtesy card. And I'll need a driver's license, please. <laughs> I am old enough to drink, you know. <laughs> all the signatures look the same, the ID is all right. Now I've got to write the number of our card and the license number on the back of the check. If there's a problem, it's supposed to help the police. Well, let's see. I told you about payroll and ID scams and a couple of con routines. I guess the only thing that's left is a little game the cops call NSF, non-sufficient funds. I use NSF when I want to buy something instead of getting cash. All it is is passing a check without any money behind it. Like uh, this account here. I opened it with $50 cash. I've already bought over $2,000 worth of stuff this week alone. <laughs> I'm in the clear as long as I don't call the bank. And they won't call the bank now. It's 5.30. <laughs> this time I'm using the nice guy routine. Huh. He looks like the manager. I'll have him help me out and make sure that cute little thing up front notices what good friends we are. I'm looking for um, something just like this. Nice body jacket. What's the size, sir? 41 long. 41, yes. We Got do it. have one right in here, sir. Terrific. Hello there. How Hi. Are you? Hi, thank you. Okay. Whoops. Ah. Not my day. <laughs> ah, there we go. It is a lovely day, isn't it? It is. It's okay. beautiful. I suppose that uh, you want to see some ID, right? Uh, yes, driver's license. Okay, sure. We can handle that. There we are. Oh, would you take it out, please? Okay, sure. Bill told me he was hiring some sharp people. Huh? <laughs> there you are. And here you are. Uh, if you have uh, a minute, I'll have the check verified. Well, listen, I know about yours, but uh, my bank is closed. Oh, I know, but uh, we have this little computer here, and it'll just take a second. Yeah, well, listen, maybe I can help you out. Let's take a look here and see what we got. Yes, yes, here we are. Look, I've got $753.21 in the account. No problem. Uh, in my younger days, that would have really scared me. 
Finding out the store is wide. But no matter what that computer says, I've still got some ammunition. Watch. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. There seems to be a problem. Well, there must be something wrong with the machine. I don't think so. Uh, we just had it checked out yesterday, and uh, it was working fine. I just tell her I must have made a mistake. Anyway, I'm going to deposit my paycheck tomorrow, and that'll cover it. Well, I uh, have a payroll check here. I was going to deposit it tomorrow. What I do? Oh, well, let me make a phone call, and I think we can get this thing straightened out. No, she's too smart to buy that. She might be Positive. getting wise. Well, I better uh, cut out I'll right now. Sure listen, everything... I'm running a little late this afternoon. Maybe we just sort of pass on this one. All right. Some other time. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Uh -huh. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. You too. Well, better luck next time. Every now and then, things get hot, and you just have to take a powder. But no problem. I've still got my checkbook and my ID, and... Uh, there's a couple of more stores down the block, and I'm sure one of them has a fine line of coats for me to choose from. Well, it's time for your break, Michelle. I'll take over for a while. Thanks, Mr. Norton. Have you enjoyed your first few days here? It's been fine. It's great. Well, Everything has gone all right. I got used to the job pretty fast, but I don't want to get too used to it, like what Marvin did last week. I will fill out one of your ID forms, but I need some cash now. That's my first paycheck. I just got into town, and I need to buy some things for my baby. I'm sorry, ma'am. Jenny. Jenny, it's just against policy. Couldn't you take this to the bank tomorrow? Please. <laughs> oh, do you have some type of ID? Yes, I have a driver's license from where I used to live somewhere. And I have a hospital ID card. Well, why don't you fill out one of these applications for next time? You know, I've been doing this for about 15 years, and I think I know an honest face when I see one. Store lost $350 just like that. I guess nobody can tell who's a con artist and who's honest just by looking. To sum it all up, I'd say the secret to success in this game is to keep the pigeons, uh, that's the name we call all clerks, keep the pigeons from following all those procedures they're supposed to. <laughs> I mean, look. <laughs> if they ever took time to look at the ID or check the application or call the banks, guys like me would be out of business. Incidentally, you caught me at a real good time. Folks like me like to move around a lot. And, well, I was thinking of skipping town for a while. But there's time for one more hit. Just for a little travel money. <laughs> I'll bet she's new. This'll be too easy. Here, 20s, please. Do you have one of our cards? <laughs> I've been coming in here for three years. You must be new. You want to see some ID? All right. Here you are, sweetheart. This guy's just a little too pushy. You see? Everything's fine. Look, you've got some people waiting here. Mark Trimpani. I think I've seen that name. Would you mind taking the license out, please? Hmm, she must have read a book. This has been all good. You want to see something else, a social security card? No, this is fine. Of course they're the same, honey. I signed both of them. Okay, everything seems fine. Uh, look, uh, I had to be at work ten minutes ago. Do you mind? Right away, Mr. Trimpani. Look, if you had any experience at I'm all... I'm sorry, you... sir. I, I need more cash to cover your check. I'll just be a second. Tony, you can con anyone. Mr. Norton, act like nothing's wrong. A man whose name is on the list is at my stand. I told him I needed more cash. What's the name? Mark Trimpani. 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 A couple of the stores called me about him. I just don't know how it happened. We cashed two checks for him. I already called the police, but I wanted to tell some of the stores in the area right away. He's using the name Mark Trimpani. About 5'10", salt and pepper hair. When we told him his check was bad, he grabbed it and walked out. Yeah, pass it on to a couple of other people, will you? Uh, yeah, he was using license number uh, N0540-3876. You stall him as long as I can, and I'll get the cash. Sorry for the delay. Be just a second now. Look, next time I'm taking my business elsewhere. I'm sorry, sir. 
Okay, he's here now. Miss, I've been waiting here for ten minutes. Thanks, honey. I'm sorry, ma'am. Sorry. Ten's here. Twenty's here. Wait a minute. I don't like this. She can't be that stupid. 352 from Roxbury Mountain. What can I do now? I I'm sorry, Mr. Trimpani. I, I need to see some other ID. It's a setup. This is ridiculous. Give me my check back. Come on, come on. Give me back my check. Come on. film was awesome. All right. All right. That was really great. Uh, I love vignettes like that. And I also love when you, uh, when the main character is the criminal and they are letting you in on all the secrets because this film, uh, while intended for shop owners, uh, and law enforcement is also a how to, uh, for, uh, potential uh, paper hangers so <clears throat> very interested in, in films like that all right um, let's watch some electromagnetism at work enjoy events of the past and present tomorrow our vital concern is you today's youth future depends on you. To untangle today's problems, we need to understand yesterday. We hope this film series will make you aware of the people, places, and events which have helped shape our nation and our world. Manufacturers Hanover is pleased to sponsor this educational film as a special service to schools in the New York City area. years ago, the great scientist Sir Isaac Newton proposed that various colors of light were basically similar phenomena. About a century ago, another great English scientist, James Clerk Maxwell, suggested that all possible forms of electromagnetic energy, from radio waves to light waves to the later discovered atomic radiation, were similar wave phenomena. This program describes the various forms of electromagnetic energy and how they have been applied to meet human needs. Like ocean waves, long rolling swells or short breakers on a beach, 
sunlight and other energy transmissions are basically wave-like in character. The various types of energy transmissions, light, radio waves and others, differ only in wavelengths, together making up the electromagnetic spectrum. A pioneer in understanding radiant energy was Dutch-born physicist Wilhelm Röntgen. In 1895, experimenting with electrical discharges in a blacked-out vacuum tube, he noticed that some distance away, a sheet of paper treated with barium platinum cyanide began to emit light. He had discovered invisible rays capable of penetrating solid objects and exposing photographic plates. He called his unknown rays X-rays and his first X-ray photographs amazed the medical and scientific world. A year later, Henri Becquerel, who had been investigating Röntgen's X-rays, discovered that mineral crusts placed on photographic plates wrapped in light, tight black paper would make an image on the plates without being exposed to light. Radiations from the minerals penetrated the black paper and in later experiments penetrated thin strips of aluminum and copper. Becquerel had discovered radioactivity, though he didn't call it by that name. In 1898, Marie Curie, using instruments devised by her husband, Pierre, began to examine all the elements then known for traces of radiation. Finding many spontaneous sources, she proposed the word radioactivity to describe the phenomenon. Later, she succeeded in isolating a new, strangely radioactive element from an ore of uranium. She called it radium. Also in 1898, a New Zealander, Ernest Rutherford, concluded a lengthy study that led to the realization that there were two types of radiation, each with different powers of penetration. He called them alpha and beta. An even more penetrating type of radiation was discovered by P.V. Villard. It was somewhat similar to Röntgen's X-rays and given the name gamma. Electromagnetic radiation, such as gamma rays and X-rays, is invisible and silent. We measure such radiation by its wavelength. In this diagram, we can see types of radiation with three distinct wavelengths. This is a relatively long wavelength. We can create these waves with special equipment, which transmits them from a broadcasting station. The waves can measure up to a kilometer from crest to crest. We cannot see or hear the waves, but a radio receiver can transform them into sound waves we can hear. The waves will pass through buildings and people and do no harm. They do, however, lose some of their strength as they pass through things. The concrete and steel reinforcing rods in an overpass absorb so much radio energy that there is none for the radio to pick up. Shorter wavelengths can be used in transmitting TV pictures. The length of the rods on TV antennas is related to the wavelengths of transmission. Radar employs shorter waves, wavelengths which will not pass through aircraft or ships. Instead, radar waves bounce off objects, return to the sender as images on a screen. Shorten the wavelengths a little further and we have microwaves. Today, people use microwaves for cooking. Microwaves can be dangerous, but safety devices are built into microwave ovens. Let's see how far we've moved down the electromagnetic spectrum. So far, we have seen radiations from radio, TV, 
radar, and microwaves. Now let's discuss an even shorter wavelength, infrared radiation. Such infrared rays are used to operate a TV by remote control. We can detect infrared with our bodies and feel the deep penetrating wavelengths. They bring relief to sufferers of muscular pain. We also feel infrared coming from fires and stoves. By using special heat detecting film, we can take pictures of heat, like this. Rescue workers find people buried under debris by using heat detecting cameras. So far, none of the radiations discussed have been visible to our eyes. To detect them all, you have to use special instruments. Now we'll consider wavelengths which are even shorter, the visible light wavelengths from 400 to 700 micrometers or 4,000 to 7,000 angstroms. Each color you detect with your eyes has a particular wavelength. As the wavelengths shorten, they reach the level of ultraviolet light. Such ultraviolet light promotes tanning, though too much exposure can be harmful. Ultraviolet light has other uses. Here, forensic scientists use ultraviolet light to detect alterations and forgeries in documents. The document on the right is genuine. The left one is false. As wavelengths become shorter still, we reach X-rays. Since they were discovered by Rentgen a century ago, X-rays have proved very useful. We use the radiation we call X-rays to penetrate solid objects and produce images for doctors to examine. We are now down to very short wavelengths, less than the thickness of an atom. We need to know about atoms because that's where the X-rays start, from inside atoms. An atom is small indeed. For instance, it's probably hard to believe, but there are more atoms in a pencil dot than there are people in the world. Yet atoms are very important because everything, not just the pencil dot, but everything is made up of atoms. You are, I am, rocks, liquids, all consist of atoms. Let's look at a typical atom. Each atom is something like a miniature solar system. The outer shell consists of tiny particles. These are electrons. The cloud of electrons surrounds a central part called the nucleus. The nucleus is made of two kinds of particles, which are relatively much bigger than electrons. But let's return to X-rays. Because they have energy, they could do harm if not carefully controlled. The source of the X-rays is surrounded by lead so that the operator and patient are protected. Only a limited amount of the X-rays are used to make a picture. X-rays are energy coming from the innermost orbits of electrons. Of course, only certain atoms give out X-rays. Gamma rays are similar to X-rays, but have more energy. Here, they are in their place in the electromagnetic spectrum. Gamma rays are potentially hazardous to life, but we can protect ourselves from their effects by ensuring there is a safe distance from them or by shielding the source with very thick lead or concrete. Like X-rays, they can be used in medicine. Carefully controlled gamma rays can be directed to kill cells which have become tumors. Many years ago, hypodermic syringes were expensive, so each syringe was used on many patients. 
each time they were immersed in boiling water to kill off any germs which might cause infection. Nowadays, syringes are sterilized by gamma radiation while in a new germ-proof bag. Each syringe, much cheaper than in the past, is used once, then thrown away. Boxes of syringes traveling on a conveyor belt move through a specially shielded room containing a radioactive piece of cobalt metal. The gamma rays don't make the boxes on the conveyor system or the syringes radioactive, but they do kill any germs on the syringe. Radiation plants like this run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, processing surgical devices, cosmetic powders, and plastics. Even food can have its storage life extended by gamma radiation. Here's another use for gamma rays, testing the combustion chambers of jet engines. They run for hundreds of hours at very high temperatures, and it's essential that no cracks develop in the metal. If there are fine cracks, they may not be detected by the human eye. So once again, gamma rays are used to take pictures. If defects exist, the chambers are replaced. As this program has shown, most forms of radiant energy are both useful and potentially hazardous. Sunlight, for example, is necessary to life in many ways. Without it, we'd have no food. Yet the sun's rays can harm us, even kill us. As with sunlight, so with most wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. Once we've learned how to deal with them safely to protect ourselves, they've proven very useful. The Science Screen Report has been presented to you as a community service of Manufacturers Hanover. Uh, thank you, Man uh, Manufacturers Hanover. Um, and looks like Towering Imbat has uh, is sorry for bothering us and wants to promote my channel and the price is lower than any other competitor. Um, wow, it's been a while since we've we've had a spam bot. Um, so it, that's kind of a quaint message. Uh, anyhow, thanks for tuning in today. Uh, we learned a lot. Learned a lot. Uh, learned how to uh, do fraudulent checks. We learned about uh, electromagnetic waves and um yeah uh i'm filling time here with just me going uh yeah everybody have a great weekend if you like what you saw hit the thumbs up button hit the like button uh those are great ways to support us uh tell other people about what we do uh those are other ways to support us um you can also financially support us by using the super thanks button uh, or by going to ko-fi.com slash avgeeks or patreon.com slash avgeeks. Uh, we also get pennies of ad revenue from you watching other films on our channel. Um, although sometimes the people that wrote the background music gets that money, uh, which is frustrating, but okay, sure, whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, that's another way... If you like what you saw, you can watch other things that we have uh, and recommend other people watch what we have. So thanks again, and uh, have a great weekend. And then I guarantee you we're going to watch films about the eclipse on, on Monday. So there you go. I'm just spoiling it for you. That's what's going to happen. Um, yeah, everybody take care. And we love you. We'll see you soon.